The second presentation we will hear, and then we will pause for a question and answer session on both um, of these first two presentations. Uh, so the second presentation is about the ethics of research on commercially owned online spaces. I, would the, the second team come up, please? So this team spans the behavioral sciences and computer science and maybe some other disciplines too. Medicine. Medicine, thank you. Um, to ask some hard questions about internet ethics. <coughs> the problem is that online commercial spaces hosted by manufacturers of products like toys, pharmaceuticals, tobacco, alcohol, firearms, are increasingly sites of consumer activity by contrast with where that activity used to happen in physical spaces like retail outlets. And these online spaces, unlike the physical spaces, have terms and conditions restricting very tightly the use of their online material. Researchers who used to study consumers' behavior in, the, in publicly accessible physical spaces might be locked out of these increasingly important venues. So this team's goal is to understand and elucidate right and wrong action and research on these spaces. I love the title, Be Careful Where You Click. Please introduce yourselves also when you, when you come up. Um, hello everybody, my name is Kate Smith. Um, I, my colleague Joanna Cohen is here as well. Um, our other colleagues from the other schools are not able to be here today. Um, all that I want to do is, um, and then turn it over to Caitlin Weiger, who's going to present our work, is to thank the, um, thank the funders of this work and also to say just how timely this initiative was for us. Um, Joanna, Caitlin, and I have been working on, um, Kate, um, with Caitlin on her master's thesis and we had to come to a stop when we came up with this issue around um, what are we allowed to do in commercially owned spaces. And this was a perfect opportunity to not only sort of dig in a little bit and see if we could find a solution rather than just a roadblock, but also to think creatively and expansively about what other fields in research at the university might this be applicable to and to bring them in together and to work on this together. So over to you, Caitlin. Thanks, Kate. I'm Caitlin Weiger. I'm a PhD student at the School of Public Health. And I've had the absolute joy of working with an amazing team of faculty over the past year on this project, looking at how companies are using terms of service and other restrictions to decide who's able to access websites and what they can do with the website material once they're there. So just a very tiny bit of background, since we're kind of time constrained, on the industrial epidemic. So this is a term we use to refer to the commercialization of products that are damaging to health. So combined smoking, alcohol, Unhealthy food and guns are responsible for millions of deaths every year in the U.S. Even the pharmaceutical industry is complicit in misuse of drugs that leads to hundreds of thousands of deaths. More than, even worse, they spend billions and billions of dollars marketing these products. And we know from a very robust library of research that exposure to this type of marketing is associated with increased liking for that product and increased product use. So here I have some examples. On the far left, you have a tobacco pack. And at the bottom, you have a URL that's circled in red. And that takes you to a brand website. And for my master's thesis, I wanted to go to these websites and conduct a content analysis. What kind of marketing are they using on these websites? But you had to register. And you had to say you were a tobacco user. And uh, together, after consulting with general counsel, uh, we were told, no, you cannot lie. You can't say untruthfully you're a tobacco consumer. That would violate the contract, and you can't knowingly and illegally do that. So we stopped. Um, and then we decided through this project to expand and look at other industries too. So we also have an example of an advert game that's on the McDonald's website, super appealing to kids, full of McDonald's branding, an ad from the Bushmaster website. Um, it went on. It went with a quiz that tested online manliness and an ad from the Coors website associating beer with strength and adventure. So all things that we find troubling in public health. And we know that all of this marketing is moving more and more online. And the online domain is much more restricted than the physical one because companies are able to slap contracts on them. So we decided to look more systematically at what companies are doing, who they're keeping out, and how that has implications for research. So to do that, we use Statista, which is an online statistics portal with market data to identify 14 companies in the domains including cigarettes, beer, whiskey, fast food, firearms, and mental health pharmaceuticals. 
So we identified a few top companies from each domain, we downloaded their terms of service contract, and we also documented what kind of registration requirements they had or any other restrictions. So we used line by line emergent coding. Here are the codes that emerge. I'm not going to dwell on them because we're going to talk about them in the results. So first off, restrictions. There were three types of restrictions that we found. The first type was a registration requirement. We only found these on tobacco websites, but they required users to list their full name, their mailing address, email address, phone number, the last four digits of their social security number, their date of birth. So a lot of information, and the, one of the last things we do is say, I am a tobacco consumer and I certify over the age of 21. So if you want to explore tobacco websites and research capacity and you're not a tobacco consumer, you can't go any farther than that. Um, we also saw pop-up windows when we first got <coughs> And so this was typical of alcohol websites. You had to enter your date of birth or your age. And this was pretty easy. You could enter any age you wanted, basically, as long as it was over 21, it would let you through. There was no way for them to verify that that we're aware of. Um, so not great for keeping out underage people, but unless you're an undergraduate under the age of 21 involved in this research, no serious implications there. Um, and we also found age restrictions in the actual terms of service contracts. We're going to talk about more here. So two tobacco and two alcohol companies said you had to be over the age of 21. The other two alcohol companies said you had to be the legal age of product consumption. One pharma company said you had to be over 18. All three food companies said you had to be at least 13 with parental consent. One gun company said you had to be over 13. And the other companies didn't have any, any restrictions on the age of the user. We also found that all the websites had an option to create an account, and there were restrictions around that. So, Many websites explicitly stated that users had to keep their login information confidential. So if you were thinking like, oh, you could just like use a tobacco consumer, they could make a, an account and we could use their login credentials, terms of service contract says no, you cannot do that. And they also say that you can't list untrue information. So <coughs> you also can't lie to get on there. And all product websites also stated that just being on the website constituted acceptance of the terms of service contract. And all but one said that the terms of that contract can change at any time, and only three stated that they would tell you when those terms of service changed. So if you're involved in research, you have to check the terms of service every time you go to a website, and if it changes in the middle of your data collection, what was allowable might not be allowable anymore. So things can change midway through, which can really mess up your project. We also found that personal use uh, of the website was always allowed, so you could always just go on there, view the content for your own personal use. But it's pretty clear that research isn't for personal use. The whole point is to disseminate our findings to a larger audience. And commercial use was prohibited on almost all the websites, with just those four exceptions that you see. And it's very unclear where research falls. Like, we're not using it for commercial use, even if it is not personal either. So this was super ambiguous and the contracts didn't really give us any details there. We also tried to clump websites based on how restricted they were, um, based on what you could do with the material you found there. So five websites, including two tobacco, two alcohol, and one food, said that you could not do anything with website material other than view it. So if you want to conduct a basic content analysis, you can't download or save any images. <coughs> And online content is changing all the time. So you have no record of why you made coding decisions and you can't store anything. Seven websites were considered moderately restrictive. Um, so they might allow you to download or copy something, but you can't share it with anyone else. So if you're working with a data team, that's going to really restrict how you can function in that team if you're not allowed to share any of the stuff that you're seeing. And only two websites were considered minimally restrictive. They allowed you to download, copy, and also share and distribute, but usually in limited circumstances. So there were also um, all of these, all this language around how they could restrict access at any time, usually for any reason. So if a company is aware that you're using your account to look at their marketing and they don't want you to, they can just block your IP address. They can kick you off that site and not let you on, and they don't have to give you a reason. And as far as we could tell, there's no appeal <coughs> to 
And 10 websites also listed consequences for violating terms of service contracts, including having your IP address blocked, your login credentials revoked, having your content deleted from the website, but of greatest concern, they can bring legal action against the user resulting in civil or criminal penalties. So they can sue you. So our conclusions, terms of service are defined by the companies. They get to say what is legal and illegal with their content, and there's very little you can do about it if your university is gonna say you have to adhere to those contracts. And restrictions on downloading, copying, sharing, all of these are logistical necessities of conducting research that might be blocked. And even though it might be legally questionable to try to breach these contracts, we didn't consider it unethical. This is important public health surveillance research, and we know surveillance of marketing is really important to inform regulation, and that regulation has the ability to protect a lot of people. And we think that is more important than, than following these contracts and refusing to break them. We also found that people are already publishing on websites, and they're not aware that they might be opening themselves up to lawsuits. And it's really critical for Next Steps to establish guidelines to guide researchers, and support them and protect them that institutions are willing to stand behind. Thanks.